Look, we're going to turn now to a story that every time I do stories about this, it just literally upsets me. Um, a young New Zealander called Malachi died in the care of someone who was meant to take, be taking care of him, and they killed him. And, of course, when such a tragedy happens, we have inquiries, don't we? And someone writes a report. And this has been going on for decades in this country, that we write reports and we say this shouldn't happen and we must find a way to stop it happening. And here are some recommendations in our report to stop it happening. And it doesn't. And often the recommendations don't get picked up. Well, one of the big recommendations that's been flying around forever from the latest report into Malachi's death is that there should be for, you know, care workers, teachers, social workers, any suspicion of child abuse or a child is being abused, should be, it should be mandatory, compulsory, to report that to authorities. But the government says, oh, we need to have a pretty hard think about that. Well, do we? I wonder if we do. And isn't this just a tragic tale that is going to play out time and time again? Well, to talk about it and talk about how the community might respond to just the latest in the tra latest tragic death of a young person who was meant to be being cared for by the state. We're joined by Mirapikarau Kawatait. She's a um, chairperson of the Fana Ora Commissioning Agency, former CEO of Women's Refuge and someone who's been active in politics and issues around um, social care and the welfare of our people for a long time. Mirapikarau, long time no talk to you. Lovely uh, to see you again. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Sure, yes, nice to be with you. All right. Um, I think we're okay, are we? For Yep, yeah, okay, good. Um, Mira Peckett, there's something horribly familiar about Malachi's case and indeed the official response to it, isn't there? We've seen this dozens of times before. Absolutely. Um, as you're quite correct, we've seen this time and time. And I suspect, um, Sean, we will continue to see this as well because little really significant systemic, systemic change has occurred within that organisation. Mm. Um, but I know that we always look to the organisation and, and find fault with them. However, um, you know, we always have to look in the, to, at the home environment. Our children are brought up in homes and that, I believe, is where we should be focusing our attention, our effort and indeed our investment as well. Okay. Of the 15 recommendations made in this report, which, to your mind, were the most important? And do you have any hope that there'll be action? Well, this, um, this, this list of recommendations joins the lists that we've seen from all the other reports that have been done in recent years as well. Um, but the one, as you mentioned, when we started, um, was is really about mandatory reporting because there, there were at least, and not just on behalf of the... Um, the families that try to do some reporting, but there were five or six other organisations involved, education, health, justice, obviously um, MSD as well. So the mandatory reporting is, is required and it should have happened some time ago. And that would then, I believe, have prompted early intervention had they done something then. To, to my mind, it is such a no-brainer that if you're working in any of those agencies you've mentioned, there is an onus on you to primarily want to protect and care for children, right? And therefore, an onus on you, and in fact, I would say there should be a legal requirement on you to, to report this stuff, I presume to police would be the mandatory reporting. I mean, this is, for years we've been having this argument. What is the reluctance to do it? Well, I think the government, it would then, that would require government uh, to, to introduce legislation. Yeah. And why shouldn't they, obviously? Yeah. Um, but the government is all, all, would always want uh, government departments and others, doctors, etc., as you said, social workers, to be responsible enough and responsive enough to uh, report without having to, um, to be required to report. And the reason for that, I guess, Sean, is that they, the um, people, People don't want to get it wrong. They are afraid of upsetting families. They're afraid of upsetting their co-workers. They're certainly afraid, uh, afraid of upsetting doctors and, and social workers. And everybody's afraid of upsetting every everyone else, 
without putting the child at the centre of their concern. Yeah, yeah, and I tell you who's and most afraid is the kid who's being abused, who is the kid who's living in terror. That's the only person's fear that we should worry about, to be honest. Exactly. It is the only per person. If you, put the if you put the child in the centre of your concerns, then they would have acted and they should have acted and people would act a lot earlier, rather than everybody jumping up and down now after the event. And um, but you're right. That uh, that requirement for mandatory reporting has always been put, uh, booted to the curb, kicked to the curb. Nobody wants to deal with it. Uh, and that I believe is probably one of the things that had it happened 10, 15, 20 years ago, we would have 50 or so children running around today in our country. That's yeah. I, I'm with you on that. Look, the other issue on this, and I'm going to raise it, and you respond how you want. There is a feeling or a perception that mandatory reporting would be culturally insensitive, and let's not mince around, the majority of these cases are Maori kids, right? It's just the statistics tell you yes, that. Yes, um, yes. And, yes. and that as we bring childcare services, and um, and it's increasingly the community providing the services, the Maori community working with their own, is there some feeling that mandatory reporting would set Maori against them and it is somehow culturally insensitive to demand it? There could be a bit of that, there could be a bit of that, but really I think what we should be look, looking at is uh, if we get to the families early, if we get to the families early and let the families do the reporting. Now, how about that for a change? Oh, yeah, but look, we've, we've had cases in this country, uh, Mirapeka, where the parents have been the only people home and someone's killed the kid and neither of them will dob the other in. You know, there have been plenty oh, of tones true. of that's silence true. that have lasted for years. So. I don't know that we can rely, and I'll be frank, on these feral bloody families that allow their kids to suffer like this. Well, I mean, they're the last people you would put your faith in, aren't they? Well, they are, but the one one thing I do so is say, um, Sean, is that in every one of those families where there have been, um, there, there's been the reluctance um, to report or the reluctance to even talk to the families, there have usually been grandparents or older members of those families who would have stepped up. But every time they have offered, what I have heard, a social worker has said to me, um, you know, rotten apples don't fall far from the tree. So they don't look to the wider family let alone the immediate family. I can understand perhaps the immediate family, yeah. but they don't look, let, look look to the wider family to say who's 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 available, who do you trust, who can we trust to look after the lives of our mokapuna. And so, you know, the, these families, the answer lies actually within those families and you've got to get to them, you've got to sort out who, who, who will actually protect their whakapapa. And it's really as simple as that. 